Oh yeah. That sucker is packed, jam packed. <laughs> Look at the uh, debris field down on the bottom, goodness. Hey, welcome back to the shop, I'm Jason. And today we've got a Super Duty back in the shop for some maintenance. This is my mom and dad's new Tremor. They've had it for a little while, but they haven't gotten started on the maintenance. They, this is a 2022 with 75,000 miles on it. And I've given them a couple recommendations to move forward with prepping this thing for long-term use. One of those recommendations is just basic maintenance. So let's start at the beginning with an oil change, air filter, and then we're gonna go underneath the truck. We're gonna rotate the tires. We're going to service the suspension. Now I know you're thinking there's nothing to service on this truck, but ah, there is. So stick, stick around to see that. And then we're gonna take part in a multi-part series on this where we hit all the fluids underneath one step at a time. Like I said, this has 75,000 miles on it. The previous owner's maintenance records are unknown to us. So we're gonna go about it in what we believe is the right way to do it, to prep this thing for long-term service, great towing and great reliability. So let's get right into it with our oil change. And you see this thing is big, so I'm gonna get a stool so I can get my big butt up inside the hood. So up under the hood, we're gonna start with some general inspections. And something that everybody with one of these trucks should be looking at is your batteries. These come with a lead acid battery for the most part. I've heard of some guys having AGM batteries installed on their trucks new. My old truck had these same lead acid batteries. They're terrible. And I'm working on convincing my mom and dad to upgrade to AGMs and then we'll fix that in Forescan. You can see they corrode and make a big mess in here. Past that, we're going to double check our oil level. I always recommend checking your oil level before your oil change, just to see if we were consuming any oil or once we get underneath, if we see any oil leaks, we were losing oil. This isn't a BMW though, so I don't imagine it's gonna be losing much oil, if any. It is, however, low. So perhaps at 75,000 miles, it's consuming a little bit of oil. The oil itself is quite clean. Looks all right. We are what I would imagine to be about a quart low, which is interesting to find. Then go ahead and proceed to pull what looks to be the smallest oil fill cap ever off and set that to the side without losing it. And down, we're gonna look at our belts. You should have the truck running. Take a look at your tensioner, see if it's wagging all about and see if you see anything else abnormal or you know, something to look for would be oil trace from your power steering, coolant leaks, you're not really gonna have a brake leak because then you wouldn't have brakes. That would be a bummer. My brake! Besides that, not much else to talk about under here. Let's get underneath. Now, since we're gonna be doing a cross rotate, it's actually like a forward cross. I like to mark my tires, throw them out in the driveway while I'm working on the truck. Obviously I'm using a lift, so I have an advantage here. If you're using a jack and jack stands, do it however it works for you. But while they're off, I also like to give them a good solid clean. And because I'm old and fragile and my back is even worse, I like to do it as low to the ground as possible. So even better, if you've got a fragile back like me and you've got some teenage help at home, oh, you, go re <laughs> you go and recruit them to help you get the wheels off. Thanks, bud. The wheels off, we're gonna start at the brakes and the hubs as far as our underside inspection. And what we want to look for is we wanna double check the thickness of our inside and outside pad. They should be relatively the same, like within 90% of each other. Then we're gonna follow our brake line up and around and we're just gonna make sure we don't see anything kinked, bent, broken, rubbed, chafed, anything like that. because. Man, a brake failure would be just the end of your day. Moving back over to our shock, we're gonna rub around to see if we have any type of sticky or um, liquid residue to make sure they're not leaking. And then we're gonna move out to our hub. Now, in this case, this truck has aftermarket method wheels with a closed off center cap, so you can't see through there, which means with the wheel on the truck, you cannot manually lock your hub. I don't personally like that. I understand that the auto hub should work, but should there be a case where you're off road and it doesn't, well, you have to take the wheel off to get to the stupid thing, or you have to break this cap here with the three little bolts inside because these bolts aren't fixed, they float. 
So you can't unscrew them from the outside. Ask me how I know that. So while we're here, what we're going to do is we're going to manually engage the hub into the locked motion. And then what we'll do is we're gonna spin our head in to the inside and we're gonna spin. Yeah, there we go. And we're gonna make sure that it's engaging. And I can tell it's engaging because it's hard as hell to turn. And the tremor, well, they're on my light. The tremor has the limited slip front diff, which means it's driving the other side, making everything that much harder. So we'll spin it back to auto, should disengage. There it goes, and it disengages. So I like to do this a couple of times just to make sure on both sides that everything is functioning properly. Now, secondarily, what you can also do is you can run your hand across your vacuum line here that is actually the actuator down through the seals and just make sure as you see it running up and into the engine bay that again, you don't see anything chafing, broken, rubbing, or anything like that. So hopefully it does work while you get out on the trail. We're going to clean this corrosion along the inside here. Well, it's not really a big deal. Eventually these rotors are going to get replaced. So I also like to just shoot a little bit of lube in there. Not enough that's going to get out onto the rotor face, but enough that's going to help to inhibit some of this rust in the future. So moving right along our front suspension inspection, if you drive a Super Duty or you drive any vehicle with a solid axle front, you've heard of Death Wobble. Wobble, wobble, wobble. Death wobble happens for a variety of reasons, but one of the primary reasons is wear in the front steering components, whether it be the ball joints or the bushings. As soon as you put bigger tires, bigger wheels, lift kits, things like that, you're increasing the wear on these units. Now from underneath, it's darn near impossible to inspect whether or not these are loose. However, some folk will take a large set of adjustable pliers or a uh, C-clamp and they will work to see if they can squeeze these joints together, much like this one, and see if there's any play. Now, this has a little bit of play in it. Realistically, the best way to inspect the ball joints and the bushings on this truck is on the ground while under load. We gotta get under the truck to check our um, ball joints and bushings while it's under load. So I've got my helper in the truck up there and he is going to steer left and right, short bursts so that I can see what's going on at the ball joint and bushing level. Go ahead, bud. So when we get under here, we're looking specifically to see if these bushings are moving. Now you can see this one is slightly pivoting in and out. We look over here, we should, we'd be looking for up and down play there. You feel it, it's the easiest way to do it. That feels okay. Let's go to the other side. First, we're gonna check up here at our shock. That looks all right. Ah, rotate. Get under here, we'll hit the other side of the shock, the stabilizer, not too much movement there. And over here at the end, let's see, I see that upper drag link popping in and out, just a minuscule amount right here. You can feel it when I put my finger in there, it pops up. Bottom looks pretty good. It doesn't look like it's at replacement stage yet, but we definitely want to watch that ball joint. And from this angle here, it's a little easier to see this pushing just moving in and out ever so gently. That's going to compound over time as well. There are a lot of manufacturers of aftermarket components for these that are stronger. Instead of ball joints, you have spherical bearings, all sorts of different things that you can do. It's up to you what route you want to go. Stock works. This truck has 75,000 miles on it. We'll see what my mom and dad decide to do as we do more maintenance on this rig. While I'm under here, what I'm looking for is torn ball joint boots. That's the word I'm looking for. Sometimes they just fall out of my old head. So torn boots up here, we've got a big bushing. Well, big on torque, not big on size. 
that likes to wear. And in fact, I can see that this one is starting to tear. So this is one of the primary points that you're going to get side to side movement because this arm controls the lateral movement of your front axle. When this bushing goes bad, it allows for play there. And then the harmonics of the tire spinning are going to cause it to shake or to drive against itself. Any other play inside of your steering linkage here is going to be worsened by that bushing. Secondarily, while I'm under here, you know, famous words while I'm in there, I am going to lube all of the adjustment points. There's three of them here. So you have your steering uh, center and then you have your tie rod here. When you adjust this one, you're adjusting the toe in and out on your wheels. When you adjust this arm up top, you're adjusting the center line of your steering wheel. So you really can do an alignment on these at home as long as you're not trying to measure caster or camber. It's basically a string alignment, fairly simple. And like I said, I'm a firm believer in long-term maintenance. So I'm going to wind up lubing a whole bunch of the bolts on this front end here, at least just the threads to provide a little bit of anti-rust protection for later when I have to work on this. Some of these, like the drag link, drop link here, if that's the name for it, I always forget. It's something like 400 foot pounds. I don't even have a torque wrench that goes that high, so I'll have to get a torque multiplier when I do it to do it right. Additionally, double check your uh, front cover. You don't have any leaks or anything going on around the diff. And besides that, we only have one other thing on the front axle to inspect. And this is actually going to be our first lube point that's an actual lube for the suspension. Here we are, obviously being four wheel drive, our front axle has U-joints to the outside. These U-joints are lubricated. There's one Zert fitting inside of this joint. So what I like to do is I like to go around the joint and clean it up a little bit. Just wipe where I can all the way, make sure that Zert fitting specifically is super clean. Because of this darn limited slip, this guy is quite difficult to turn, but just work your way around wiping around each one of the joints. We're just gonna pump a little bit of grease in and then we're gonna rotate. Let's see, that was three pumps. It's definitely not gonna be enough. Spin her around. I've got the uh, front wheels turned a little bit so that the joint has to move a little bit more. What I'm looking for is I wanna see a little bit of grease hopefully coming out of each one of these joints. Now I'm a believer in not blowing the joint out with too much grease because I wind up doing this probably more often than would normally be recommended. I do this at every service. So in this case, this truck may not have had this done ever. I don't know. And I'm gonna make sure it's nice and clean in here so that the next time I do this, it'll be much easier. Quick tool tip. If you're doing any type of Zert fitting greasing, whether it's on a truck, a trailer, or who knows what, you're gonna want one of these lock and lube adapters. Yeah, that's the name of it. It's spring loaded, you can lock it in place. There's the straight connection, there's 90 degree connection, 60 degree, all sorts of different things. This thing has been a game changer for lubing stuff up with a Zert fitting. Click it on, lube it, pop it off. You're not dealing with trying to unscrew that stupid little thing or getting jammed up on there because of the pressure inside of your joint or whatever the case. I'll put links down below to Amazon, to my affiliate store. These things are great. You buy one, doesn't cost you anything more, but I get like a small percentage of that. Really helps the channel and I appreciate it. Onto the back axle. What could we possibly need to check at the back of the truck? Well, there are actually a few places that I recommend checking every time you service your vehicle. And if you're as over the top as I am, every time I road trip a vehicle, I check these things too. The first, I don't know why I have a hammer yet, would be the spare tire. The awesome design of this setup is that the valve stem is on the inside. So you may get out on the road and have a totally flat spare tire and not know it. So you should drop that bad boy down, fill it up with air. Little known trick, the spare tire tools, it's just a three H drive. So if you're working on your rig at home, like I am right here, and I just need to drop the spare tire to put air in it, you can do it this way without getting all your tools out of the trunk. Now I get to the valve stem. 
we're gonna wanna check our shocks. And as you can see, the rear shocks on this one, both have a little bit of residue coming out of them. Now, I don't know that that's enough to necessitate replacement, as long as they're still functioning well and the truck's not hopping and bopping and dropping all over the road. However, in my case, I would probably replace them. That's just me. Like I said before, I lube up around my rotor hubs and I'm gonna hit this with a wire brush just to break everything up. Check your rear diff for leaks. This one has a minor weep out the bottom. That's not a leak, that's just a minor weep. When we either do a rear diff cover or a rear uh, diff oil change, we'll adjust that later. Now for the actual lube point in the back. I can hear you all screaming, there isn't anything. There are no U-joints, there are no service cert fittings, there's nothing. However, when your truck is exercising the rear end, these leaf springs are all riding up against one another and sliding as they move. And built in from the factory are these little dampers at the front of the leafs. Those dampers come from the factory with grease on them. Now, it's entirely possible that I'm wrong in doing this every time I service a vehicle, but whenever there is a leaf pack like this, I will drive them apart and then I'll put some high temperature, high pressure grease in there, much like this uh, little can of Valvoline that I have here. And I will use my grease brush just to throw a little bit in there. Now this is gonna do a couple of things. It's going to allow the leaf to slide freely. It may also pick up dirt. So the fact that it's always touching leads me to believe it won't be a big deal. It will help to make sure that it's not chattering and making noise for all of the pavement princess trucks out there on the road, much like mine was, that didn't see a lot of dirt action. So what I'll do is just like this, I'll split the leaf, put a little bit of grease in there. You could even shoot some white lithium or something in that nature. Or if you were really worried about it building up with dirt, something like a dry lube silicone or something of that nature, maybe even graphite. We'll get that. Then we'll get actually onto the meat and potatoes of this episode with the oil change. Help a brother out, comment down below. If this is totally ludicrous, no, nah, he didn't pop up like the state farm ads, but whatever. And I shouldn't do this. Let me know why. Let everybody else know why. I could be directing people in the total wrong way here, but this is what I've been doing for a long time on everything with leaf springs. Man, I hope I'm not wrong. Now my last oil change, I experimented a little bit on my 6.7 diesel with a much larger oil filter with popping a hole in the bottom of it to see if we could drain the filter without making a big mess. Now it is definitely recommended if you do this that you have the right filter already just in case. Now, when I popped a hole in my last filter, what wound up happening was it drained out a little bit, but it still had nearly three quarters of a quart of oil in it when I opened it or I dropped it down. So this one, I'm also going to pop a hole in the side to see if that aids in letting it breathe a little bit easier. And you see there is oil coming out of the side as well. So that's kind of interesting. We'll see how this goes. All right, I was getting tired of waiting for this thing to drain, so I popped two more holes on the bottom. It's still draining, and I'm still tired of waiting. So I'm gonna throw a pair of pliers on there and get it spinning a little bit. See if I can't crack that seal loose up top. Now, obviously, this is all totally pointless. You could just unscrew this thing, drop it into your bucket. I'm using a five-gallon bucket just because of convenience. It works really well on these larger capacity oil changes. I know eight quarts isn't quite that much. Um, this was primarily for use on my diesel, but because it's already been ruined, this is, well, there goes the rest of that oil. Apparently I didn't wait long enough. All right, experiment number two, failed. <laughs> well, that was dumb. It could also be because the oil sump is full. That would be great for experiment number three. We'll drain the oil pan first, then the filter, and see if that works better. Before your new filter goes up, I like to make sure to clean up my mess. And while I'm down in here, I make sure that, double check that the old O-ring isn't stuck to the block or the oil filter housing there, because that would just ruin your day You'd wind up with a nice leak right there. And it might not happen right away, but it will happen. A little bit of oil around the ring. I like to write the date and the mileage that the change was done. Makes for really easy reference. Anytime I'm under the vehicle 
or looking in from the side. This only needs to go hand tight, not super arm strong tight. Otherwise you're gonna hate trying to get it off later. All right, so the drain plug. The drain plug, I was like, oh, it must be a 13. A 13's kind of loose. I thought everything was metric now. Who the heck still uses standard? What is up with that Ford? Half inch fits perfectly. Nice and snug. The 13 mil was loose. I like to twist until I feel that it's totally loose while applying pressure to it. That way I can pull it out of the way. Our drain plug has an integrated oil seal. So if you need a new seal on there or it's damaged, you're gonna need a new drain plug. It doesn't appear to be magnetic either. One eternity later, we can put the drain plug back in. This drain plug does have a torque somewhere between 19 and 20 foot pounds, I believe. I haven't really torqued drain pans in a long time. I go tight plus some. This does not have to be so tight that it's holding the pan together because, well, it's not. So that should be about enough. All we're doing is we're sealing the opening. So please don't strip out your aluminum pan. So my solution to not dumping gobs and gobs of oil all over the engine bay, hopefully, is this super long fuel funnel that I use to put fuel in my M5. This should work just dandy. The 7.3 Tremor motor, or I guess Godzilla gas engine, all the different names you want to call it, takes eight quarts of oil. So this could take a little while with this tiny little funnel. Now, of course, I'm using platinum high mileage oil because I'm using yellow funnel. So I had to use the yellow oil bottle. No, this is just what my dad dropped off. What's your favorite oil? Personally, I like to use Mobile One and everything else, but that's been more about convenience and price and everything. To get our air filter out, we just have these three clips here, and then we're gonna lift. We'll pull that out. I'm gonna need a second hand, so I'll set the camera down. I'll get that guy out. Kinda stuck in there. May have to disconnect it either here or here looks like here in order to get the filter out. That'd be the easiest way of going about it. Probably don't even have to pull the mass air out. There we go. Darn. Yep. Isn't this fun learning together? There we go. Now it'll come out nicely. Oh yeah. That sucker is packed, jam-packed. <laughs> Look at the uh, debris field down on the bottom, goodness. Better get my vacuum to clean that out. All right, slide our new paper element in. Rotate your top hat the right direction. Unlike the first time, I had it a little bit backwards. Now you wanna get those teeth to slide in down on the bottom. You're gonna to have to get the boot on in order to accomplish that task. Nice tight fit. Clip, clip, and clip. All right, then we'll put our mass airflow sensor clip back in. Since we didn't take it off the actual sensor. All right, air filter's done. We put eight quarts in, started it, ran it for a minute or two. I just checked it and it looked low. So I'm gonna get, I gave it a few more minutes to drain down just in case. Still looks a little low. I'm gonna put some more in. Perhaps that's why it was low initially before we changed the oil. Cause there's certainly no oil leaks down underneath. I did prime the filter, I suppose. Maybe it takes a little bit more than the eight quarts. Maybe it takes eight liters, I don't know. There's gotta be some math here wrong somewhere. Maybe the dipstick is wrong. I'm not sure. We gotta get the oil back in. Then we gotta get the tires back on, reset the oil indicator and reset the tire pressure monitor since they're gonna be in a new location. But we're not gonna do those things in this video because I've already done those videos. So I'm gonna link down below to my uh, 
tire pressure reset on my truck and my truck was the exact same as far as the oil reset as well. Take a look down below at those guys, like, subscribe, comment, do those things in this video that really help out. Buy from any of my links, that helps out too. And I will see you in the next one. Thanks for watching. And in case you were wondering, I put about a half a quart more in and I got the oil level up to within an eighth to a quarter inch of the top of the dipstick in the fill line. Let me know down below, is that okay? Is that what you guys have had running into on your cars? What, what, are, what are the words coming out of my mouth? Eight and a half quarts. That's what I put in this thing to get it to where I'm comfortable on the dipstick. It was low when it came in, but there are no leaks. I wonder if eight quarts is too little and that's what got put in it last time. Go down below, let me know.